Good evening. One of your classmates requested a video solution for number 62 from chapter 18. If you had trouble with this uh, using the solutions manual, it may be because there's a typo in the solutions. Otherwise, the problem is not particularly difficult. In order to look at this problem, we have to first talk about isothermal lines on the PV diagram, otherwise known as isotherms. So an isotherm is a curve along which the temperature of a gas remains constant, specifically the temperature of an ideal gas. So if we're looking at a fixed quantity of gas, that means the number of moles does not change. And remember, R is a constant. And we're also talking about a fixed temperature, then everything over here is a constant. And this may not be familiar to you, PV equals constant. You may not look at that and immediately recognize what that curve would look like on a graph of pressure versus volume, but it is in fact a hyperbola and you probably are familiar with it. So let's compare this equation, PV equals constant, to the more familiar XY equals constant. If you were to solve this for Y, and let's keep things simple. Suppose that the constant over here, let me hide this, uh, this video panel. Suppose that the constant over here was the number one. Wouldn't this equation say that y equals one over x? And I think most of you know that y equals one over x is an inverse relationship that looks like this. But what you may not have known is that the curve is in fact a hyperbola. So here, here are a set of hyperbolas for which the constant takes on different values. Suppose this constant over here was the number one, xy equals one. What does that curve look like? Well, we can at least identify one point um, if x is 1 and y is 1, 1 times 1 is indeed 1. So here's an x coordinate of 1, here's a y coordinate of 1. Um, since this point has coordinates 1, 1, uh, the product of x and y at this point must be the value 1. So we already know that this red curve uh, is the locus of points. That's a fancy word, right? The locus of points satisfying this equation. And if we look at this equation here, x equals 2, or excuse me, this curve, x equals two and y coordinate equals two right here. Two times two is four. This must be the locus of points that satisfies this equation with a value of four on the right-hand side. So all you have to do is plug in different uh, values on the right side and you get a different hyperbola. Well, instead of y and x, imagine that the abscissa is P for pressure. I'm sorry, this is the abscissa, the horizontal coordinate. Suppose that the abscissa is V for volume and the ordinate, those are the old fashioned terms, the or ordinate is V for volume. Then you would also be looking at a hyperbola. So if I just go back a slide here, how come I can't, there we go. Um, again, constant temperature would make this quantity on the right side a constant. So the locus of points on the PV diagram for which T does not change is a hyperbola. If these axes represented pressure and volume, then as I trace the laser pointer here up the curve, you can see that the volume would be decreasing. As the volume decrease, decreases, the pressure rises. Uh, so those two state variables are changing, P and V, but T would be the state variable that is not changing. And you know, in general, all the state variables would be changing. If you just pick some arbitrary trajectory in the PV, on the PV graph, there, there's no state variable necessarily that would be constant. But there are a few important cases that your book talks about, isobaric processes, isochoric processes, and isothermal processes. And we're looking at isothermal um, uh, changes of state in this problem. Okay, well, I'm sure you all encountered the equation of a hyperbola back in high school when you took algebra two or pre-calculus whatever your school district called it. So you're familiar with this equation. Uh, this is the equation that's appropriate for a hyperbola that looks like this. The, I call them the wings. The wings of the hyperbola would intercept the x-axis. If you switch these around so that the, the y term has the plus sign, then those wings would intercept the y-axis. Well, um, tilt your head 45 degrees, if you would please. You can draw, you know, there's, we're not restricted to a single set of axes in life. You could imagine another x-axis, which I'll call the x-prime axis. That's 45 degrees from the x-axis. Here would be the orthogonal y-prime axis. 
And if you tilt your head and look at those black axes that I just drew, you can see that these hyperbola actually look like these hyperbola do in relation to the original x, y axis. So hopefully that convinces you that, that these are hyperbola. And if you were to express the equation of these hyperbola in terms of x prime and y prime, then that equation actually would look like these equations. You'd have an x prime here and a y prime here. So really you're talking about a rotation of axes and a transformation of coordinates. That's something you might encounter in linear algebra or some other class in the future, some math class. Uh, and if you want to know some nomenclature, I think that when the equation, when the hyperbola are uh, squeezed between the x and y axes, I think they're called rectangular hyperbola. Okay, this is what this problem is all about. This is the, uh, the graphic from the chapter problem. Uh, we're told that a quantity of gas, 80 moles, in fact, they tell us the number of moles, it's 80 moles of gas is taken from position one on the PV diagram, this particular state, up to state two along this particular trajectory. So this straight line path is not one of the three special cases that your book presents. It's not an isotherm, because an isotherm is not a straight line, it's a hyperbola. It's not uh, an isochoric process. Isochoric means same volume. That would have to be a vertical line path, so it's certainly not that. It's also not an isobaric process. Isobaric would be constant pressure. So it's, it's neither or none of those three. It's something different altogether. We wouldn't expect any of the state variables to remain constant along this straight line trajectory. Uh, but the first thing to ask is, what's the, um, what's the temperature uh, for state one and state two? You can see that if, if the gas were to be taken through this, uh, series of states, the temperature would never change because that's along an isotherm. So we're, we're first supposed to just find um, the temperature along that isotherm. And before I do that on paper in a moment, see if you can memorize the values of P and V. Now we could use either, the, either of the endpoints on this isotherm. Remember the gas starts here and it ends here. It doesn't matter which you use, I'm gonna go with, with this one here. So if I drop down a perpendicular to the V-axis, I see that the volume is two cubic meters. That's the SI unit, so I don't need to convert. I'm gonna write that down off to the side here. And you can see that the, the value of the pressure is 100, but be careful with the units. It's 100 kPa, we'll have to convert that into SI units. And don't forget I said that the the number of moles is 80. And they're asking for the temperature of that isotherm. This is trivial, right? All we have to do is apply the Pervenert law. We're solving for T. Have you noticed how I make such poor use of the space on my paper? I guess I like killing trees. And since we haven't done much of this, I'll go ahead and include units here. Let's see, pressure, we've got 100 kilopascals, that's 100,000 pascals. Well, a pascal is a newton per square meter, because I'd like to confirm that the units work out the way they're supposed to. And uh, the volume here is two cubic meters. Down here, we've got 80 moles. And I believe the ideal gas constant in SI units is 8.31 joules per mole per Kelvin. And later we're gonna see the significance of that joules. There's something about an ideal gas that allows us to calculate its energy based on number of moles and the temperature. It's all in the units. Sometimes uh, you, can, you can get a lot of, gain an awful lot of information just by looking at the units of quantities. Okay, let's check what we've got here. Meters cubed over meters squared would be just meters. So we've got Newton meters, do we not? Newton meters, that's the same as a joule. So the joules upstairs cancel the joules downstairs. You can see that these moles cancel. I'll just put joules here. 
the joules cancel, and we've got one over Kelvins in the denominator, which would be a Kelvin up top, just like we expect. Okay, let's see what temperature we're talking about. This is the absolute temperature. Remember, anytime you use the ideal gas, if you solve for temperature, it's going to come out in Kelvins, not Celsius and not Fahrenheit. Okay, 100,000 times two divided by 80 divided by 8.31. We're talking about a temperature of 300. 0.8 Kelvins. Your book likes to make a big deal about how you're supposed to say Kelvins and not degree Kelvins. Like you sound like a, a bumpkin if you say degree Kelvins. But you know, I've got some books on my shelves written by Nobel Prize winners, and one of them is from Europe. And in the book, it says degrees Kelvin. So I'm not worried about about that too much. Part A was trivial, part B is a little more difficult. They would like us to calculate as we move from state one on the PV diagram to state two along this straight line path, what is the greatest temperature achieved by the gas? At the very least, you should recognize that the temperature is not, not going to be constant because we're not moving along an isotherm. That the, uh, the straight line path is not a hyperbola. Okay, so what I've done here is throw up a set of hyperbole on the PV diagram. Each of these would be a possible isotherm. And I've only drawn six here. Well, I didn't draw it. I pulled this off Google Images. I, I would have preferred that this had even more isotherms because I, what I'd like you to recognize is, uh, think of this blue isotherm as the, the isotherm at which the gas begins. So this is state one, and here's state two at the other end point. And as we move along, that straight line path, straight line trajectory through the PV diagram, the volume is decreasing, the pressure is increasing, but the temperature is also changing. As you cut across isotherms, you're, you're um, experiencing, or the gas is experiencing an, a change in temperature, specifically an increase at first because uh, the, the isotherms correspond to increasing temperatures in this direction. So the, the lowest temperature isotherm would be this one, the highest temperature isotherm would be this one. So uh, for the first half or so of the trajectory, we're cutting across higher and higher values of temperature and then back down to lower and lower temperatures. And maybe you have, uh, you can get some intuition here graphically that the, uh, the isotherm at which the temperature is maximum would be the one that is tangent to the straight line path. Again, that's just kind of a, a gut feeling there from looking at the, the graph. We would need to use math to prove that, but it sure looks like the, the maximum temperature corresponds to the isotherm that would be tangent to the straight line path. And that sort of uh, technique shows up in a lot of places in, in physics or physical science. And we're not gonna use that to answer the problem. You probably could. You, you probably could state that mathematically and use that as a way to solve the problem, but we're not gonna do that. Instead, what we'll do is get the equation of this line. That's not hard. You all learned in algebra how to get the equation of a line. There's a couple of ways to do it. You can use the point slope form of the line or the uh, slope intercept. Let's go with slope intercept. Uh, we need to determine the slope here and the intercept. Of course, we're not talking about y and x. We're talking about p e and v. Okay. Well, let's just read the slope directly from the graph. As we go from here to here, what's the change in the vertical coordinate? Well, the pressure drops by 200 or from 200 to 100. So that's a drop of negative 100 kilopascals. That's the rise. Remember, one way of thinking about slope is rise over run. And the run is simply an increase of one cubic meter. So here it is. The slope, see my, uh, my value for M here, I've just evaluated it. Uh, the change in the Y coordinate, excuse me, change in the V coordinate is negative 100 kilopascals. The change in the V coordinate as we go from one point to the other is positive one cubic meter. And then for the intercept, uh, it's not actually drawn, but hopefully you can see that if you were to extend this line in both directions, it's going to intercept here on the V axis, that would be the V intercept, but the P intercept is up here at 300 kilopascals. And if you're not sure of why that's the case, you could just use the slope, right? Just decrease by one cubic meter, 
increase by 100 kilopascals and it would have to intercept at 300 kilopascals. That's where I got this intercept from. And of course, when we use SI units, we can simplify this. This is another three zeros here. So we could uh, write this as a total of 10 to the fifth times volume. Same thing with uh, 300 kilopascals, two zeros, and then three more here. Do you see also we can factor out the power of 10 there? Let's factor out 10 to the fifth. And here is our equation for pressure in terms of volume. This equation is specific to this problem. Uh, there's another constraint on the relation between P and V. That would be the ideal gas law. But uh, specific to this problem, there's a further relationship between pressure and volume. Okay, so let's go back to the handwritten notes here and finish this. The top line here is the relation that we just found for pressure in terms of volume for the specific trajectory, straight line trajectory from state one to state two. And off to the side, I'm going to write the derivative of pressure with respect to volume for that particular trajectory. So this, this derivative is only applicable for this particular problem. And the reason I'm doing this is because we can use this for one method of solution. DP, DV, well, this is just a constant and it goes away. What's the derivative of V with respect to V? That's just one. Then of course, you've got this constant of negative 10 to the fifth. So here is the derivative. It's just a constant. This is, again, this is only applicable for that predict particular straight line trajectory. So I'll use this in a moment. Uh, we also know from the ideal gas law that T at all times, wherever you are on the PV diagram, the temperature has to relate to the pressure and volume in this way. And I should point out, and your book talks about this, that's really only true if the gas is at equilibrium. And what's an example of a non-equilibrium situation? Well, an easy one would be right after the spark plug uh, sparks in the cylinder of, of an automobile engine. There's a, an explosion of that gas-air mixture and a rapid expansion, that's really not an equilibrium moment for that gas, although you can approximate it as such. So equilibrium means you're not, you're not making any rapid changes to any of those state variables. Um, so everything's had time to settle down and reach its steady state values, so to speak. It, if you're in equilibrium, then you can apply the ideal gas law. Otherwise, strictly speaking, it's not valid. Okay, uh, we're looking for when the temperature is maximum. Right now, we, we've written temperature as a function of two variables. And if we want to know how temperature depends on those two separately, we would have to use partial derivatives. Partial derivatives show up all over the place in more advanced thermodynamics. But we don't have to do that for this problem because we have a further relationship between P and V. So let's substitute this expression for P into this formula. We've got 3 minus V times V times 10 to the fifth. Okay, so now we've written temperature solely as a function of volume. And we'd like to know when or where the temperature is at a maximum. So hopefully your calculus one, first semester calculus is well rehearsed enough that you immediately recognize that this is an extremum problem. All you have to do is, is take the derivative of temperature with respect to volume, set it equal to zero and look for, um, look for the solutions. So, this looks quadratic, right? We've got a V squared with a minus sign. Roughly speaking, the plot of temperature versus volume for this particular trajectory is some upside down um, parabola. And we're looking for the particular value of the volume. We'll call this V max, not because it's the max volume, but it's the volume associated with max temperature. So this would be T max, all right? And at T max, the, the slope of the tangent line is zero. So in other words, we're gonna set the derivative of temperature with respect to volume equal to zero to find T max. Okay, well, that's fairly easy, is it not? Uh, D, T, D, V. This garbage is all a constant. And what do you do when you're taking the derivative of a function that's got a constant on the front? Just ignore the constant and put it back in at the end. So we're really just taking the derivative of 3v minus v squared. So let me go ahead and um, show all the steps here. 10 to the fifth over nr 
times ddt oops ddv derivative derivative with respect to volume derivative there, there must be an easier way of saying it 3b it's been hundreds of years right hundreds of years since it was developed and we're still saying take the derivative of i mean that's so many syllables syllables we need a shorter way of saying it 3b minus v squared okay that's 10 to the fifth and the derivative is 3 minus 2v. And we're supposed to set that equal to 0. Well, the only way for this entire thing to be equal to 0 is if the quantity in parentheses is 0. And here is where your solutions manual had a typo. I forget what they did, but they goofed something about the exponent. I think they still had a square here. And maybe that's what threw you off. But this is very simple now. The volume is simply, you just set this equal to 0, and you get that the volume is 3 halves cubic meters. So one and a half cubic meters. And I should really call that V max. It's not the max volume. In fact, the max volume, if you go back to the graph, was the original volume in the bottom right of the trajectory on the PV diagram or PV graph. Uh, the v max really means the volume associated with the maximum temperature. When the volume takes on this value, uh, that is when the temperature is at a maximum. So I'm going to pause and go back to that graph. The initial volume was right here, two cubic meters. So that would actually be the maximum volume. V max does not mean maximum volume. It's the volume at which the temperature is a maximum. So as we move from this state on the PV diagram up to this state, right when we're here at a volume of one and a half cubic meters, we'd be right here on the straight line path. That would be the point at which we're tangent to the, the isotherm. That would be the isotherm associated with max temperature. It's the isotherm that's the farthest in this direction and yet still intercepting the, the straight line trajectory. In fact, it intercepts it at one point. That's what, how a tangent line works. Now, the problem wasn't asking for the volume at which the temperature is maximum. They were asking for that max temperature. So we need to go back and solve for that. And that should be relatively easy. Now that we have the volume at max temperature, um, we can go back up to this formula for pressure and solve for, can I uh, get this all in the frame at one time? Oh, fine, I'll just rewrite it. We know the pressure is 3 minus V times 10 to the fifth for all points along the straight line trajectory. So P max, this is lowercase p, your book uses lowercase p for pressure. Again, this is not the maximum pressure along that trajectory, it's the pressure at which the temperature is a maximum. That's the notation used in your solutions manual. That's easy. Just plug in the volume at that max temperature. That would be one and a half cubic meters. So three minus one and a half is one and a half. So one and a half times 10 to the fifth pascals. Or you could call that, what is that, 150 kilopascals? That makes sense because we started at 100 kilopascals and did at 200, I believe it was. So this is right in the middle. Okay, we're still not quite done because, again, they're really asking for the temperature. So the last thing we have to do is say the max temperature, we just use the ideal gas law, is the pressure at max temperature times the volume at max temperature divided by nR. There's our one and a half times 10 to the fifth pascals times the one and a half cubic meters over the 80 moles and the 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. So I'm expressing units here. And before we do this, remember the original temperature on the isotherm where we started was 300.8. And when you looked at the picture, on the way up that straight line path, that straight line path just you know kisses that other isotherm at a higher temperature. So we expect this number to come out greater. If it doesn't, it means I goofed up with my calculator here. One and a half times 10 to the fifth times 1.5 divided by 80 divided by 8.31. We're talking about a temperature of 338 kelvins. Okay, so that is in fact higher than the starting temperature. All right, I'd like to show you an alternate method of solving this last part, part B. It's not much different from what we've already done, but it's a, it's a nice technique that may serve some of you in the future. Let's do this with differentials. Let's have some fun with calculus here. All I have to do is start with the ideal gas law, PV 
equals N R T. And I'm going to quote, I'm doing the air quotes here, take the differential of this equation. And um, I've never seen this presented in a manner that I'm going to explain it here, but here's how I think about it. As you're moving your gas around the PV diagram, as you're changing the state of your gas, all of the, the various state variables might be changing. Pressure is a state variable, volume, temperature. I believe number of moles is also considered a state variable, but that's not changing in this instance. Um, here's how you can think about it. Think of all three of these quantities, P, V, and T, as depending on some fourth quantity. So imagine changing that fourth quantity, and who knows, maybe it's the, maybe it's the total energy. Whatever that fourth quantity is, P, V, and T all depend on that fourth quantity. And I'm going to take the derivative of the entire equation with respect to that fourth quantity. So we'd have, and let's say that that quantity was called U, the letter U. I'd have a DP DU in there. And because of the product rule, I would also have a DV DU. I would have a DT DU. So you could take the derivative of the entire equation with respect to that fourth variable. And then at the end, you'd have these little DUs everywhere and you could just multiply by DU and get rid of them all just cancel them all out. So when you take the differential, you, you skip that intermediate step of writing DPDU, DVDU. You just, you just go straight to uh, what you'd have at the end with the remaining differentials. So here's how that works. Because of product rule, I would have uh, DP times V plus P DV. I've taken the differential of each of these in turn, according to the product rule. Now these are constants, so they don't have differentials. Like DN would be zero because dn represents change in moles, and there is no change in the number of moles in this particular problem. So I would just be left with nr dt. Now, what are we interested in? We're trying to find the derivative of temperature with respect to volume, as I recall. Now, if you look back at the, uh, the, uh, the first method of solution for this problem, what was presented in part B of your solutions manual, they take the derivative of temperature with respect to volume and they set that equal to zero. So I wanna see if I can recover from all this garbage, the ratio of dt to dv. How does the change in temperature compare to the change in volume? Well, I already have a dt here, so what I can do is just divide the whole equation by dv. Divide by dv, divide by dv, and divide by dv. Do you see how the dvs cancel here? Here we've got the derivative, derivative that we want. And I was careful to write the dV underneath the dP because now we recognize this would be the derivative of pressure with respect to volume. And now you see why I calculated that derivative initially so I can substitute it in here. So this dP dV times V is really just negative 10 to the fifth times volume plus the pressure. But now I can substitute our equation for pressure in terms of volume, right here. Um, again, we read that equation off of the graph. So when I go to add P, I can write P as three minus V times 10 to the fifth. And all of that has to equal NR times DT DV. Okay, well, what do we have here? We've got three, uh, excuse me, we've got a negative one times volume times 10 to the fifth and a neg another negative one times 10 to the fifth. So we're actually subtracting two V times 10 to the fifths. And I can write that as three minus two V times 10 to the fifth. And you know what I, what I can do lastly? I'm sorry, this is not DV DV, that would be one. This is supposed to be DT DV. The last thing I can do is divide both sides by NR. And what I'm left with is just my expression for the derivative. So this is an alternate method for finding the derivative of temperature with respect to volume. And you should recognize that. That's the same expression for the derivative that the solutions manual got for part B. So my, the approach here really is different. It's from a different starting point. But it's no surprise that we wind up at the same, uh, the same answer. I think it's very interesting, though, because how did, how did we do the derivative previously? Didn't we use the, uh, the power rule? Yeah, we took the two down. So the, the power rule was used here. Here, it was just fun with differentials. So there's something interesting going on there that makes sure, that, that ensures that this all works out. And I just marvel sometimes 
at, at the um, efficacy of this notation that was bequeathed to us, I think by Leibniz. I'm no expert on the history of calculus, but I heard once that Leibniz is the one who introduced differentials for representing a derivative. I don't think Newton was responsible for that, but they sure are convenient and they get used a lot in physics derivations. All right, buenas noches. <laughs>